Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference channel. My name is Jesse Day. The next VRIC, we're already counting down to it, January 21st and 22nd at the Vancouver Convention Center. Stay tuned for tickets. For now, of course, we're keeping the channel going with some great guests for you guys. And today's guest is the CEO of Santiago Capital and the originator of the dollar milkshake theory. It's Mr. Brent Johnson. Great to have you on. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, happy to talk to you. And uh, I always enjoy going to the Vancouver uh, conference. So uh, appreciate the, the follow up here. Yeah, appreciate having you on, of course. And I want to start with this. And that is, I think most viewers are already aware of your stance on the US dollar and the fact that it isn't necessarily going to be going anywhere anytime soon. So with this in mind, do you think the hype, we're seeing a lot of this online, particularly on FinTwit, the hype surrounding nations outside the U.S. trading in non-USD currency for energy, is is that overplayed? And if so, why? Well, the answer is sort of, and, and I'll tell you why. And, and part of the reason I say sort of is I think in, in, in today's environment, especially on social media, uh, all nuance has been lost right? Everything is black or white. Everything is going to go to the moon or it's going to die. Um, you have to go all in or you, ha you have nothing in it, you know? And, and I think, and I think that's the wrong way to think about things. Right. Um, but, but coming back to your question, I think the, what all of the headlines that we're seeing and all the news, uh, you know, reports covering this whole de-dollarization initiative, I don't think the desire is overhyped. I think the success level and the amount of uh, of, uh, of success that has been had year to date is overhyped, and I think the 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 acceptance that this is just a foregone conclusion that this is all going to work and it's going to be very smooth and there's not going to be any problems, I think that is overhyped. Uh, but I'm not ignoring all the news headlines. You you can't ignore them; they're everywhere. Um, you know, it's kind of ubiquitous at this point. My point is, though, that, you know, the ability to do something and the desire to do something are two completely different things. I don't at all doubt the desire. Uh, I have big reservations regarding the ability. And that's really kind of why I've pounded the table on the dollar, you know, over the last few years. My whole thesis has never been something that I wanted to convince everyone to sell everything they own and just own dollars because there's no way I can be wrong. The real reason I kind of started pounding the table on it is I saw so many people that, in my opinion, just had everything backwards and they would hear an idea or, you know, you'd go to a conference and they talk about, you know, hyperinflation in the dollar and the U.S. debt is unsustainable and you have to get out of the dollar. There's a de-dollarization effort and people would then go put 60 or 70 percent, you know, gold mining stocks in their portfolio as a result. And I talked to these people and I know I know this happened because I actually talked to them. Um, and when I would explain to them that the dollar was not going to go through hyperinflation, you could see the, the confusion in their eyes. Well, how couldn't it go through hyperinflation? And so my whole pounding of the table of the dollar is not an argument to convince you to go all in on the dollar. It's mainly to make sure you understand why you shouldn't go all in against it. Uh, and, and again, there's nuance in there. It doesn't mean you can't have some positions in your portfolio that would do well if the dollar did fall. But the idea that this is an inevitability and it's imminent and there's nothing that the U.S. can do about it and the rest of the world is automatically going to be successful in all these efforts is, in my opinion, just completely wrong. And that that's why I'm kind of fairly outspoken on it. Yeah, very nuanced answer. And I completely agree with you about the hyperbole getting thrown around on social media, this all or nothing mentality. I think people do have to be aware of that and be cautious about it. So I then want to ask what sort of circumstances would have to emerge for you to reverse your opinion and consider that we're actually heading towards a scenario where the U.S. dollar is losing world reserve currency status? Would it be as the years go by more and more trade happening outside of the U.S. dollar? Would it be the potential introduction of a, a BRICS nation's currency? What, what do you see on the horizon that may change your mind on the issue? Yeah, I think a couple of those things would, would at least help, you know, with the effort. Um, you know, the one thing I want to say before I get too far into that answer is I'm not sitting here saying that the dollar index can't fall. 
we could very easily have another period of a couple of years, very similar to post-COVID. So, so the dollar ran up into the COVID crisis, which the dollar always rises in a crisis. I don't know why anybody is surprised by this. It's, that's just the way the system is designed. But then post-COVID, we had a couple of years where the dollar fell and it fell significantly. It went from 102 to 90. So, you know, at a 12% pullback. That could easily happen again. You know, we went from, you know, from that 90 level, we went all the way to 115. That's a 25% run. That's a pretty heck of, that's a really big run for a currency. I think, I think people kind of that are new to currencies think, oh, 25%, no big deal. That's an enormous move in a currency. It's, it's almost unfathomable to, to have a currency move that far that fast. So it wouldn't, it doesn't surprise me that the dollar's pulled back. And it wouldn't shock me at all if the dollar pulls back, I don't know, 95 to 90 again, you know, over the next year or so. I don't think that will happen, but that won't surprise me. But the point I want to make is that is not the dollar dying. That is not the end of dollar hegemony. That's just the system continuing to function as it already does. And so what would cause me to think that things are changing was typically when the dollar pulls back, just like it did after 2020, after the COVID scare, is many places around the world issued even more US dollar debt. Countries, corporations, individuals, they took on more dollar debt. They didn't use that weakness in the dollar. They didn't take that opportunity to pay down their dollar debt. They actually actually took on more dollar debt. And the reason these entities around the world take on more dollar debt is because there's so much demand for dollars, whether you think it should be that way or not, doesn't matter. The market, the overall global market has huge demand for global dollars. So if you borrow in dollars, you actually get a lower rate. And so if you know if you borrow in dollars, I'm just going to make up a number. Maybe you pay five percent. Whereas if you're in a tur you're, you're a Turkish corporate and you borrow, you might be paying twenty percent or in, in local currency, right, or whatever the number is. And so, you know, what I would have to see, I would have to see countries not only stop issuing new U.S. dollar debt, I would have to see them actually use the period of dollar weakness to actually pay it down. I would have to see the increase in trade in other currencies start to rise, not just be talked about. And then I would actually have to see one of these new competing currencies even come into being. That's the thing is there's a lot put on this new BRICS currency. Well, the BRICS have been, the BRICS were organized in the summer of 2009. That was kind of at the bottom or kind of at the height of the financial crisis. That's the first meeting the BRICS had. And ever since it first started, it was they would talked about, you know, potentially at some point having a common courtesy that they could trade amongst themselves. It's basically a global South trading group looking at ways and discussing ways that they could work together to kind of raise their overall stature in the world. OK, well, since that time, um, those currencies, the, 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 the Chinese uh, yuan is about flat since the dollar. To the dollar since that time. Now it's a managed currency, or it was pegged at one point. It's kind of loosely pegged now. Um, without that peg, maybe it wouldn't have performed as well as it has. But it, so it's about flat. But if you then look at Russia, the Russian ruble's down over fifty percent since two thousand nine. Uh, the Indian rupee's down over fifty percent since you know that time. Uh, the South African rand is down over fifty percent, and the Brazilian real is down over fifty percent. So this idea that you're going to take these five current five or six currencies. And even if you introduced gold into that basket, let's say you did these five or six currencies and you put gold and oil into it, it's still down versus the dollar over that time period. Not only that, but who's going to who's going to run it? Who's going to design it? Who's going to enforce it? Who's going to design the system off of, over which it trades? And who 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 has the power to regulate it? Is that given to one of the company, one of the countries, all the countries? So there's a again the idea is there's nothing wrong with the idea. But going from an idea to an actual product and then to actually implement it, those, those, those are two dramatically different things. And, that, and that's, that's what I want people to think about. Um, a headline does not equal, uh, you know, implementation. <laughs> so, 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 so that's, some, and then the other thing I would have to see, I would have to see, and I always say, this is always the part where people don't like when I say this, but I would also have to see the U.S. just sit back and watch this happen without pushing back at all. And I argue that they will absolutely push. If the US dollar ever seriously comes under threat, they will push back. Now, again, the dollar going from, it's at 102 today, if it goes to 95, that's not, that's not, that's not the dollar under threat. That's probably what 
to a certain extent, some people in the U.S. want to happen. That keeps the system going. Um, but if it ever came under serious threat where not only dollar hegemony, but but the U.S.'s role in the world as the, you know, the top of the mountain, the, the global hegemon, however you want to describe this, if that ever came under serious threat, I am convinced that they would fight back against it. And in that chaos, in that chaos, whether they're fighting back economically, whether they're fighting back militarily, whether they're fighting back diplomatically, whatever it is, I, I think that the dollar would rise during that environment. And that's, again, and this kind of goes back to why I've pounded the table. Again, I'm not saying the dollar has to go up every day in a straight line for the next 10 years and it will never, ever go down. That's not, the, my point is, is that in a crisis, the dollar will rise and you, you cannot ignore the possibility of that. Or if you do ignore the possibility of that, you've left your portfolio open to potentially the biggest risk that exists out there. And so, uh, and not only do I think there's a number of economic factors that back up the dollar, but at the end of the day, the, the U.S.'s role as the geopolitical hegemon also back, backs up the, the, the U.S.'s role as, as the global reserve currency. Yeah, very good points. I, I want to get your thoughts on the relationship between gold and the dollar, because a lot of people seem to think that they're just inversely correlated. When the dollar falls, gold should rise and vice versa. Is that accurate or is it more complicated than that? Well, in in very short periods of time that it sort of, I mean, if you think about it, if the dollar is rising, then it, as the denominator rises, then the numerator often falls. So if you're pricing gold in dollars as the dollar rises, you would think that the gold price would come down. But it doesn't always happen like that because there's a number of different factors that go into it. And one of the things that I've explained uh, or I've tried to get across is that you can have high levels of inflation in the dollar or in the, in the United States and have the dollar rising versus other currencies. It just means that the other currencies are going through even higher levels of inflation. And if you think about it, that's kind of what the whole dollar milkshake theory is. As I said at the very beginning, and a lot of people think that th this, is, this is another reason kind of why I've pounded the table on this so hard is I think that a lot of people in the gold community just, just have not liked the thesis because they have grown up, for lack of a better way of saying it, thinking that the reason that their gold is going to go higher is the dollar is going to go down. OK, fiat currency loses value over time. This is true. I, and I, I've always agreed to this. And I am probably one of the biggest advocates for gold that there is. I think everybody should own gold. I think gold's going to go to five thousand dollars and probably higher than that. Doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow, but I think that that will happen. But just because the U.S. dollar is a horrible fiat currency and we have profligate government spending and we have debts that we can never repay and we have welfare systems that are out of control, so does every other country. And it's not like you leave the United States borders and you get over into Europe or Japan or other parts of Asia, and all of a sudden you have these genius leaders who would never spend more than they could afford and don't get into these profligate policies because the whole world is kind of in the same place. And so if all fiat currency loses value over time and natural resources rise versus those fiat currencies, you can get into a situation where the dollar and gold and other resources rise versus all the other currencies. And that's essentially what, what the, the whole dollar milkshake theory says, is that we will eventually get into a period where all fiat currencies are losing value, but the dollar will be the last one to fall and it will be rising versus all other fiat. And I think that the we'll get into a period where the dollar and gold will rise together. And if you think about it, if you actually go back and look, and if you kind of take out the emotion of the argument, you know, the first time I started talking about this was 2018. Since 2018, the dollar is up. I think the dollar's up eight, nine, 10% over that time period. Well, gold's up, I think 40 or 50% over that time period. So that's a period of three or four or five years where gold and the dollar have risen together versus all the others. And that's that's the argument. Now, I've also said you know, that the Dow would rise um, versus all other um, competitors. And that's happened as well. So since 2018, the Dow's up versus all its competitors, the dollar's up versus all, all of its competitors and gold's up versus all the other competitors. So. That in itself is the milkshake. Um, but I also said it would be punctuated by terrifying drawdowns along the way. And I think it's fair to say that we've had that, right? Despite that the, you know, gold's had a couple of significant drawdowns, the dollar's had significant drawdowns. The Dow has certainly had some significant drawdowns. And, and I think that's kind of what we'll continue to see in the years ahead. 
Um, I think we'll see higher highs um, um, in all of those, but I think we are going to experience terrible volatility and terrible drawdowns to go along with it. What's up, guys? Quick break. My name is Jay Martin. I'm the CEO of Cambridge House and the host of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. I wanted to quickly point your attention to a link right beneath this video where you can subscribe to our new weekly newsletter. If you want to better understand the minds of the best investors in the resource space, subscribe to this newsletter. I author it personally every Sunday and I love writing it. Hit that link below to subscribe. All right, back to the interview. I want to touch on China here because you posted a chart on Twitter showing that China's debt levels are actually very high compared to a lot of other countries. So I'm guessing you're not in the camp of China being the next global superpower, at least not anytime soon. So could you break down the issues currently facing that country economically and why it might not be as much of a threat as many people seem to think? Sure. The, the, I, I know the chart that you're talking about, and I got a lot of pushback when I posted that chart. A lot of people said it was a, uh, it was taken out of context and it wasn't done fairly because you know it didn't actually include the level of GDP growth that went along. And that, listen, that's all true, but you know it was measured the same way against all countries. And you know, there's no doubt that China has had incredible growth over the last 20, 30 years. But there's no denying that that growth came as the result of in the fastest credit creation in history. Um, this, they didn't just get this by snapping their fingers and magic happened. You know, the, they threw a really good party because they borrowed a lot of money. I mean, that's, you know, if you go out and you borrow $10 million, you can throw a really good party, right? I mean, and if you can't, you should be shot on general principle, right? But that's kind of what China did. Now, did their GDP grow as well? Absolutely it grew, but there's a couple of factors that helped them grow. Number one, it was a period of time where for the most part, and this is not, you know, there's obviously been regions and places where this wasn't the case, but they did it by and large during a time of relative peace and and the uh, uh, relative global peace and relative global cooperation. You know, we had this whole globalization move. Um, they did it also during a time where their currency was pegged to the US dollar. So the capital that was flowing in didn't have to worry about, you know, typically when you invest overseas, there's a you have to take on market risk you have to take on political risk, and then you have to take on currency risk. Well, by pegging the currency, they didn't have to take on um, currency risk, right? So, so that helped. And then, you know, it also helped that the U.S. was in the process of, of outsourcing everything. So, you know, we shipped our manufacturing over there. And, you know, I'm, that's, in my opinion, that's not necessarily a great thing, or, or that wasn't a really smart move on the behalf of the United States, but, but they did it. But that contributed to China's growth. And, you know, I would argue, and I think most people would agree with this, is that, you know, whereas the last 20, 30 years, the pendulum has been swinging towards global cooperation and globalization, the pendulum has started to swing back the other way towards deglobalization, uncooperation, probably some global conflicts, both economic and, and militarily. And so I don't think that, you know, for the next 20 or 30 years, China is going to be in the same relative easy way to do this. Now, I'm not saying... I shouldn't say it that way because that makes it sounds like it was just easy for them. It wasn't easy for them. There a lot of hard work went into it and you have to give them credit for what they accomplished. But I just don't think they're going to have that same um, positive tailwind for the next 20 or 30 years that they had for the last 20 or 30 years. And, and China, again, if even if you take out the chart that you and I talked about, if you just look at the growth of their banking system assets and you look at how exposed they are to you know their real estate market, uh, the Chinese real estate market's probably one of, if not the biggest markets in the entire world. And, you know, oftentimes with relation to the United States, people will say, well, you can't taper a Ponzi. Well, that rule doesn't, you know, go away when you leave the borders of the United States. That That's true of other countries and it's true of China. And, you know, I don't know how they think that they're going to taper their credit growth without having some dramatic problems. And so, I think all of these reasons, it's unlikely that China is going to dethrone the United States as a global hegemon in the next five or 10 years. Now, 20, 30 years from now, after much you know pain that everybody, I think, will feel, sure, it's possible. I'm, I've never shut my, my, my mind to the possibility of it. But I think there's many, again, I think there's many people out there who have just accepted it as a given that the United States is on the decline. There's no possible way we, we, can, we can win and uh, that the China is on the rise and there's no possible way that they can lose. And I, I think that is dramatically mispriced. 
Can you break down the euro dollar system for us? And I know it's a very complex topic that probably would require more time than we have here to really completely dive into, but it's rarely discussed in any detail. So maybe you could just give us some basics on what is the euro dollar system? What are its implications on the global economy, the US dollar and non-US currencies? Yeah, so the euro dollar system is really kind of the key to the whole thing for me. And, you know, if anybody is listening that has not heard this term before, we're not talking about euro. We're not talking about the euro currency that's used in Europe. A euro dollar is really just a very simple way to describe a U.S. dollar that exists outside the domestic United States. Uh, that's probably the best way to think about it. And the reason this is so important is it creates a level of demand for the U.S. dollar outside its borders that no other country has. And that's a huge advantage. And so the way that the euro, so the euro dollar, think of uh, there's a market of dollars outside the United States and there's a market of dollars inside the United States. The market for the dollars outside the United States is called the euro dollar market. And that market is bigger than the market of dollars inside the United States. So there's more demand for dollars outside the United States than there is inside the United States, which sounds crazy, but that's the way it is. And the reason that is, is because uh, is it, it, there's a number of reasons, but essentially after World War II, you know, the U.S. kind of quote unquote won the war and it's al the allies won and they set up a system with the U.S. dollar at the center of it as the U.S. is the global hegemon and they tied it to gold. Right. And but then through the Marshall Plan, they had to rebuild Europe. And so there was a demand for dollars. And because the US was the biggest economy and the growing economy, everybody wanted to do business with the United States. So there was a demand for dollars just to do business with the United States. And then we were rebuilding Europe um, from the Marshall Plan. And you know there was a demand for currency there and the US was happy to provide it. So you started getting these dollar loans outside the United So. A loan in dollars outside the United States would be called a euro dollar loan. But it's important to understand that this is not the United States necessarily making the loan. It could be a German bank making a loan to an Italian corporate, or it could be a French bank making a US dollar loan to someone in Turkey. It could be Japan doing you know, financing to one of its vendors in US dollars. That, that is how you get euro dollars out. And that kind of developed with on its own. The free market did that. Now, the U.S. may have just seen it and turned a bly eye to it, but nobody mandated that that happen. That just kind of happened. And, and part the other part of the reason is there was demand because the Soviet Union needed to do business with the West, but they didn't want to keep all of their money in U.S. banks because of the Cold War. So they started holding U.S. dollar balances in European banks. So that was another part of it. But so all of this whole spider web of U.S. dollar interconnectedness outside the United States has developed over the last 50, 60, 70 years. And that market is so big now that, that, that it dwarfs the U.S. market. And so that creates an incredible amount of demand for the United States or for the U.S. dollar. And so if you think about QE, QE is supposed to put more money into the market, provides liquidity. And then if you do that, then there's more supply. And if there's the demand isn't there, then the, the price falls, right? That's how you get the dollar going lower. That's how you get other currencies going lower. Well, if you think about it, since we started QE after the global financial crisis, we've had QE1, QE2, QE3, Operation Twist. We've did uh, a number of bailouts, helicopter money, COVID stimulus. And yet the dollar is like 20% higher than it was in 2008. Now, how is that possible? It's possible because every other country had to do the same thing. And every other country doesn't have the same demand for their home currency outside their borders, but the United States does. So you can think about it when the United States does QE, they do QE for global QE, for, for a global GDP, right? They're printing for the whole world. Whereas Japan is just printing for Japan, Europe's just printing for Europe, China's just printing for China. There's not they those other countries don't have that demand for their for their home currencies outside their domestic market. And that is how hyperinflation happens. If if a country has to print and print and print, but there's no external demand for its currency, then that currency loses value in its home um, economy. And that's why you'll see these smaller economies go through hyperinflation, whereas and why you have not seen the United States go through hyperinflation 
despite the enormous amounts of stimulus and monetary expansion that they've had, right? And so that, and this is why, and the other reason this is important is because, you know, the, the money is created by via loans, right? And so there's all these US dollar loans out there. So that creates a demand for dollars to service the loans and then pay off the loans. The argument I will often get is, well, the rest of the world, all they have to do is just default on these loans. They'll default on these US dollar loans and the demand will disappear. That's true, except for the fact that, again, like I said, this isn't, they're not, they would not be defaulting on the United States in this case. They would be defaulting on each other. You know, again, it's Turkey defaulting on France. It's the Philippines defaulting on Japan. It's Brazil defaulting on, I don't know, Mexico or whoever it is, right? It's just, and so if all of that, all of those liabilities disappeared, yeah, that would create, that would, that would, uh, you know, eliminate some demand. But the problem is assets would be, you know, one person's loan is another person's asset. All those assets would be disappearing as well. So to get rid of these euro dollar liabilities, um, the euro dollar market, the countries and the corporations outside the United States would also have to be giving up all their reserves, all of their assets, or not all of them, but a significant portion of their assets. And that's what makes it so hard to do. You know, I don't know. Too, I know a lot of people who say, yeah, the dollar is worthless and it's going to zero. But I don't know too many people that are literally setting their dollars on fire because they're worthless. They still want them. They still have some value. And that's why it's really hard for the rest of the world to do this whole de-dollarization process. And, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier, one of the reasons it's really hard to de-dollarize is because to de-dollarize, they've got to give up their reserves. Right. I mean, and that's, that's very, very hard to do. Not only that. But if these trade deals do start to happen and they do start to take place in other currencies other than the dollar, that means that there is going to be less U.S. dollars circulating outside the United States. That means there's less supply, but all that debt is still there. So you get into a situation where supply is falling, but demand is constant. Price rises. And so th this is the other thing that I've, I've, I've tried to explain to people is that the process of de-dollarization, even if it's successful, is not necessarily negative for the price of the dollar. De-dollarization can really be thought of as de-globalization. De-globalization, de-dollarization is a chaotic process and it will lead to volatility in the markets. And whenever you get chaos and volatility uh, in the markets, the dollar rises. And part of the reason it rises is because liquidity disappears. So if you get global liquidity of dollars outside the United States falling, which would happen under de-dollarization, the price of the dollar rises. And we and, and all you have to do is look at last year to see what, what how much of a problem this is. When the US dollar rises, it creates incredible problems for countries who have to import needed goods in dollars. Water, food, energy, all of that stuff is priced in dollars. And so as their currencies fall versus the dollar, and if those things, if, if food rises in price and energy rises in price, and your currency is losing value versus the US dollar, you're getting, you know, you're getting squeezed on both ends. Not only are prices rising, but your currency's value is falling. And so that creates a lot of economic chaos. And this is the answer I would give to people who say, if all fiat is being debased, it doesn't really matter that the dollar is rising versus other currencies. It's it's completely bogus. The only people that say that live in the United States or Switzerland, and they don't have to worry about this issue because they have strong currencies. You go talk to somebody in Argentina or Cyprus or Turkey or England or even Japan last year or China or Russia, anywhere where, 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 the, where they have had their foreign currencies fall versus the dollar. You ask them if that's a problem and they will all to a person say, yes, it's a problem. Again, so the people who think that the people who think that relative fiat currencies don't matter are probably first world uh, upper to middle class people who have never had to live outside the United States and have had to transact in a currency other than their own. It's a huge problem for the whole world. Great explanation. Thank you for shedding light on that. Um, 
Now, I'd like to end with the question of how you're approaching this uncertain market environment, at least whatever you can share. You mentioned you think people should own gold. Is, is that an asset you think can help preserve wealth? Um, are there any other strong contenders for preserving wealth that you see out there? And is there anything you see that presents an opportunity at the moment? Or do you advocate putting cash in T-bills and maybe sitting on the sidelines in expectation of a larger market correction? Well, I think the right way to answer this, and this is, you know, I'm regulated by a couple different national, you know, governmental agencies. So I have to be very careful what I say as, as far as advice. So this is this is just a general statement. This isn't financial advice. But in a general as a general rule, let's say a little bit of everything that you just said is 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 a good thing to think about. I think everybody should own gold. Now, what percent in your portfolio? Um, it's kind of depends on your 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 personal situation. I, anywhere from five to twenty-five percent, depending on your personal situation. I think it's probably appropriate, but I think everybody should own gold. Uh, I think that everybody should own some large cap U.S. stocks. Now, I'm not saying to go out, sell everything you own and put all your money in the stock market right now. I actually think the stock market is due for a correction. Um, but, you know, if you were to buy a handful of very large U.S. companies, you know, the Raytheons, the Lockheed Martins, the Philip Morris, Coca-Cola, you know, GE, JP Morgan and all of these, you know, they pay anywhere from a two to 5% dividend. And they're the big blue chip battleship stocks that are probably not going to go bankrupt. I think five or 10 years from now, you'll probably be happy that you had those and you get paid a nice dividend in the meantime. But I don't think you should have your whole portfolio. On. So maybe, let's, let's pretend you have 10% in gold and you've got 40% in US blue chips, right? So now, so that's 50% of your portfolio. I think uh, you could have some land. I think everybody should own some land, have some kind of a you know real estate holding. Again, not all of your portfolio, but uh, you know if you have some productive land, I think that would be good. And then you know I think so let's say you got 10 or 15% in some real estate, and that, so that leaves what 20 or 30%. And I think you should have that in T bills. I mean, right now you can get paid. The kind of bounce around a little bit. You can get paid anywhere from four to five percent in a T bill. I mean, two or three years ago, you had to go out 10 years in a high yield bond to get four or 5%. So you get incredible optionality by sitting in the most liquid thing on earth right now. And it pays you to wait. And then if, if, if we get into this crisis or if we get into a market pullback and stocks go down 20 or 30%, you've got a lot of dry powder that you can go in and you can buy these at a really good price. Um, so I think T-bills give you an incredible amount of optionality right now. And at, at this point, you actually get paid to wait. You don't get killed by waiting in T-bills. So I think, I think you know, just as it, that's kind of how I would be positioned right now. Um, because I think this is, I've been doing this for almost 25 years. And it is the most uncertain time that I can remember. Um, you know, I, I have kind of a framework for how I see the world. And, and for the most part, that framework continues to play out. But I don't know what's going to happen. And so when I when I talk to people who are just so certain they have this all figured out and they have their portfolio heavily skewed one way, listen, maybe they'll be right. And I, well, I'm happy to congratulate them if they are. But, you know, I I am always shocked by the level of certainty I, I hear when I talk to people because I'm not certain about anything. I, I think this is the type of environment where you have to be very careful. A lot of unexpected things can happen. And I think having a level of protection in your portfolio, whether again, whether that comes from gold or T-bills will hopefully allow you to kind of ride out whatever volatility or storm comes our way. And, to, and here's the other reason why I think owning e either cash or T-bills makes a lot of sense. Even if you are, even if it's a, even if you think inflation is higher than T-bills are, and if you think it's still a drag on your portfolio, here's something why I think having either cash or T-bills in your portfolio is a good thing. One, it will allow you to sleep better at night and it will allow you to not be as stressed, okay? If you don't have that in your portfolio and you're all in on something and it goes against you, even if it goes against you for a day or a week or a month, it's going to cause you stress. And if you're under stress, you're probably not gonna think clearly, right? And so the next decision you make when you're under stress may cost you a lot more if you don't have that level of protection in your portfolio, if you don't have that cash in your portfolio, whether it, whereas if you have that cash in your portfolio and you're not a distressed seller, or if you're not a forced seller, and you actually have the optionality to make your choice of whether or not you want to do something or not, your frame of mind is going to be better. I think you're going to make a better decision. And that second decision may make up for whatever lost money you think you're getting by, by, by losing against inflation 
while sitting in T-bills. And, and I think that, I think keeping your brain <laughs> and keeping your level of stress, you know, low over the next couple of years, I think that that that's probably going to trade at a high premium because I think there's going to be a lot of people out there that are just losing their minds. You already see it today. I mean, so many people are just, it, it's kind of everywhere. You just look outside and you're just like, holy cow, it's, this is a crazy world. And so I think whatever you can do to kind of keep yourself level-headed while everybody else is losing theirs um, is probably going to be a, a good thing that pays off down the road. Awesome. Well, on that note, thank you so much for joining us today, Brent. So much knowledge shared. I think people are going to get a, a ton out of this interview. Now, uh, before I let you go, for those who want to learn more, could you fill us in on Santiago Capital and anywhere else you'd like to direct people online? Sure. Yeah. So Santiago Capital, it's a wealth management firm. I do customized portfolios to you know a handful of uh, very wealthy families and individuals. Um, uh, they all have to be accredited investors. But if anybody wants to find out more about that, uh, my website is SantiagoCapital.com. It's just a landing page. It has a couple of regulatory documents and contact information, but I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody that reaches out to me there. Um, we started, a, a friend of mine and I started a show earlier this year. We call it the, It's called at MilkshakesPod.com. You can find it on YouTube. All the different uh, you know audio channels carry it. And that's a once or once or twice a week uh, program where we talk anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. And we just kind of talk about what's going on in the world. Um, it's kind of a lighthearted uh, look at the madness and the markets. And then I'm very active on Twitter, um, you know, Santiago AU Fund, or you can just type in Santiago Capital um, and, you, and you'll find a number of work there. And then I've done a number of stuff with Jay and VRIC over the years. And I think there's some legacy stuff on your channels or on your um, uh, your your website where they can find. So I am typically can be found pretty easily on YouTube uh, at this point. So uh, happy to... Uh, Happy to have people watch those if, if they're interested in doing so. Great. Well, I'll put links all that to all that in the description below. I can attest you're a great follow on Twitter. You post a lot of really uh, useful stuff there as well. Thanks once again, Brent, and uh, looking forward to seeing you at the next VRIC as well. Cool. Thanks for having me.